If you could turn with me to a text again in the Gospel of Luke, if you could turn to Luke chapter 18 and verse 9 down through verse 14, just about six verses. And this is short enough this evening that we can read this. Luke chapter 18, 9 through verse 14. You there? All right. And he also told this parable to certain ones who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with lowliness of mind or with contempt to look down on. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax gatherer. And the Pharisee stood and was praying thus to himself, God, I thank thee that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax gatherer. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax gatherer, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, and he who humbles himself shall be exalted. Simple story. You know, one of the problems with this story, when you read it, you miss some of the richness sometimes because you typecast it. When I say Pharisee and tax gatherer, the chances are that from our culture you get a certain picture in your mind. When you say Pharisee, you kind of think of an oil can Harry, kind of a snidely whiplash kind of a guy kind of a nasty Silas Marner, kind of an Ebenezer Scrooge that's kind of the essence of everything that is evil in religion. That's Pharisee. And when you say a tax gatherer, when you think of this guy, you probably think of a kind of an Errol Flynn-like fellow who's kind of a swashbuckling nice guy who's just kind of gone wrong at a point in time. And you're convinced that if you knew them both, you'd really like this tax gatherer and somehow you'd really hate this Pharisee. But I want you to know that that's not right. It's exactly the opposite. Uh, a tax gatherer, you know what a tax gatherer is? A telonis. A tax gatherer was a fellow that the Roman government auctioned the job to, and he was a Jew. He was your own countryman. And he bought the right from Rome to tax his own countrymen. And if the staple tax on a bale of cotton or whatever was 20 cents, he would at least tax 20 cents for Rome, but then whatever he could extort, whatever he could defraud, he'd take that much and he'd pocket it. And that was okay because Rome expected him to do it. And this was a guy that made money off of Israel's being subjected to the pagan, that Rome was making Israel pay a tax back and forth to their own nation. It was a great indignity. Uh, in the covenant of God, in the book of Deuteronomy, in the old covenant of I will bless you if you do these things, the last curse that God puts upon the nation Israel is that if you are disobedient, he talks about how you'll be cursed in the field, you'll be cursed in the country, and you're going in, you're coming out, and then the last curse is, is that I will exile you among the nations, and that you'll be a stranger in your own land. And that's the way Israel was. And a tax gatherer, was a Benedict Arnold of the Jews, and he bought the right from the Romans to take advantage of the fact that Israel had been judged by God. He got ahead. He was the same today we'd look at as a pimp or a dope dealer, that he had taken a vice and an evil, and he was making money off of it. As a matter of fact, in the New Testament, whenever Jesus Christ is challenged as to whether he is the Son of God, the challenge is that he is seen in the presence of tax gatherers. He has gone to be the, the guest of a man who is a sinner. Whenever he said, Zacchaeus, come down. Today I must spend time at your house. These guys were disgusted. Whenever they said to John the Baptist, what must we do? John said, don't defraud anyone of anything. 
It was common to be a farce. Remember Zacchaeus? Lord, if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I'll pay back four times as much. As a matter of fact, there was an ancient historian named Tacitus, and he wrote in the first century that there was a city in Israel that built a statue to its honest tax collector. Now, that's what they thought of a tax collector. If your sister brought home a tax collector, you'd take her off into the next room, and you'd say, what's the deal? If you were a, a uh, husband or wife, and your daughter brought home a tax collector, you would consider yourself a failure as a parent. That's a tax collector. So let's get the right idea about these guys. A Pharisee. You know what a Pharisee is? The uh, Hebrew word from Pharisee means the set-apart ones. They were the very opposite of the tax gatherers. Whenever Israel was conquered by the Babylonians, who were conquered by the Persians, who was conquered by the Greeks, the Greeks in about 171, 176 B.C. had a guy named Antiochus Epiphanes that tried to make it illegal to be a Jew. And he Grecianized all of Israel. And there were a group of men during that time that were called the set-apart ones. We would call them today minute men. They were Puritan. They were pilgrim. They were the good guys. And they said, we will not bow our knee to anything that is Greek and that is Hellenistic. And they were radical keepers of the law. And there were some great men of these Pharisees. This was an institution that was almost 200 years old by the time Christ came. You have guys like Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea and Gamaliel. The Pharisees were the farthest, well, the Essenes were farther right, but they're the, as far right as you can get and be normal in the nation Israel. They were good fellows. If your daughter brought home a Pharisee, even though there were some money-loving, evil Pharisees. On the, by and large, if your daughter brought home a Pharisee, she had brought home an educated, well-heeled, quote, religious, though he was sterile, but a very religious man. And you would consider yourself a great success as a parent if you had a Pharisee. If in the city of Dallas, if there was a Pharisee and a tax collector running for office, I will assure you, that you would consider it a judgment on your culture that the tax collector got elected and not the Pharisee. We don't have any men in office or women in office that are as scrupulous morally as this Pharisee. So let's get our thinking right. When he talks about a Pharisee and a tax collector went up to pray, this is as wide in the spectrum as you can go. All right? But there's something about this Pharisee's prayer that hits you wrong. It, there's a stench that kind of rises off the page. Look what he says. The Pharisee stood and was praying to himself, God, I thank thee that I am not like other men, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax gatherer. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all I get. What's the problem with that prayer? It's not that it's a lie, because he did. In Israel, you had about two days during the year that were commanded fasts. There was the Day of Atonement and the Day of the Fall of Jerusalem. Those were fast. And later on, the assassination of Gedaliah. Don't worry about it. But they were fast. This guy fasted, what's he say? Twice a week, a hundred times a year, this guy fasted. This guy paid a tenth of everything that came into his door. When this guy said, I am not an adulterer, I am not a swindler, I'm not unjust, that's not a lie, this is true. What is it that gives you a problem about his prayer? There's something about he prayed to himself. There's something about, I thank thee God that I'm not like other men. There's something about this guy's perusing of his life, his drawing a judgment on his life from his opinion, and then looking at the worst of men, and by the comparison of his assaying of his life to the worst of men, he pronounces himself as justified. It is his eyes, it is his mind, and it is his dictate. Pharisee, are you going to heaven? Yes. Says who? Me. How do you know? My cognizance of how good I have been. How do you know that's good enough? because I have judged myself next to other men. There's something about that that stinks. 
It is called grace that has gone putrid. You don't see him call to the effect of God thinking that you created in Adam or in Abraham and Sarah a nation, the Jews, of which I came from the barren womb of Sarah. There is no thank you, God, that you gave your redemption to Israel at the Red Sea. There is no thank you, God, that without your law at Sinai, we would never know who you are. There is not thank you, God, that we who cannot approach you all approach you on the basis of the sacrificial animal. There's no recognition of his creation, his redemption, his forgiveness, his knowledge of God. All he is aware of is himself. It is grace that has gone putrid. The fact is he did have law and he did try to keep it because God had given it to him. And he did have a temple because God had given it to him. And he did have sacrifice because God had given it to him. But you see nothing of God. You get the feeling that all of a sudden, if God appeared to this guy, he would die in just this big holocaust of sin in the presence of God. He doesn't have anything to say about God. It's only about himself and others. It's the smell of grace that has gone sour. It's the smell you get if you ever get around some guy, some girl that was rotten in their old pagan life, but all of a sudden got converted and their life has changed, and you get around them now, you ever been around these guys, and there's kind of an insidious smugness. Yeah, I had all the problem. Now I got all the answers. You need them, you're in the right place, babe. And somehow you sense they have changed by the grace of God, but that grace has gone sour. You ever get around a Christian that has found a Bible church or a Bible study and is starting to learn some things, and they can pronounce the word propitiation? They know about the difference between the seals, the bowls, and the uh, uh, trumpet judgments of Revelation. They know what limited atonement means or does not mean. They've got some answers to what nobody else is asking questions. And somehow you get around these guys and you sense grace that has gone sour, that has gone putrid. Or maybe some kid that was raised by godly parents in a very fundamental church and knows his or her Bible and it takes on a smugness and you want to say, you know, you didn't ordain your family, you didn't ordain your church, you got plopped there and you smell grace that has gone sour and rancid. When I was in high school, there was a kid named Maurice, we called him Mo, and he was the first Christian I'd ever been around. And uh, Maurice used to witness to me. And I kind of blew him off. I became a Christian, and in the meantime, Maurice had blown one marriage, and he was about to blow a second. His life had gone down this. Maurice had a lot of emotion, but he didn't have a lot of smarts, and he didn't read his Bible, and his life kind of went like this. And now I became the part of the guy who was trying to help him. And he was living in adultery in the midst of his second marriage, about to bust it, which he did, and he would come to my house crying. And I would sit out in the driveway with him, and I'd say, Mo you got to turn this stuff around. And I'd plead with him, I'd love him, I'd hug him, I'd help him, I'd plead with his wife, give him a chance. And well, he messed it up again. And it was a few months after that that Maurice comes over to my house. And in the meantime, something had happened to Maurice. He had gone to this Christian meeting, and there was some evangelist up there, and he'd gotten Maurice forward, and boy, this guy had brought the whole load on Maurice, and he had gotten sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost, and uh, you name it, this guy had the whole route, boy, I mean, he had everything from a prayer language, to he had seen Jesus, he had left his body, gone to third heaven, been slain in the spirit, you name it, this guy had it, all right. Now, he came over to my house, and he sat down with me. And he had been through this miraculous, quote-unquote, transformation of all of about uh, six weeks. And he sat down. You know what he started doing? He started lecturing me on how I needed to get my theology right. And he had now this kind of a carnal smugness to it about how everybody else really wasn't quite on his beta level up here because they had not made the same warp jump that he had made he felt in his spirituality through this experience that he felt was so legitimate 
and all it was producing in his life was arrogance. And I'll never forget looking at Maurice. And I said to him, in all honesty, I said, quite honestly, Maurice, I think you were a nicer guy when you were an adulterer than now that you've got all of your supposed spirituality. Because what you perceived was grace that had gone sour in his life. Listen, I went to the Dallas Theological Seminary. And boy, you can walk in the coffee shop and you can get an argument in five seconds. You can say, isn't the air nice? And somebody can take you to task. <laughs> and I loved it there, but a lot of times you would get with some guys. And what you would smell was grace that is going sour. And I've smelled it in my life, too. And that's what you smell in this Pharisee. The grace of God has turned rancid. But this tax gatherer, there's something about him that you like, isn't there? Even though that this is a guy that you may not want your daughter to bring, it, bring him home, you read his life and there's something about him that jumps at you. There's something about the tax gatherer standing some distance away. You know, the prophet of Psalmist said, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. This guy's just willing to get in the threshold and just to stand at a distance. He won't even put himself with the A-team. He's the JV back here in the back. He's some distance away. And this guy, instead of praying to himself, he can't even lift his eyes to heaven. The Bible says of God, no one can look upon me and live. That's the essential presence of God. He can't even lift his eyes to the blue skies. He can't even go outside of the ceiling. He just keeps his eyes on the dirt. And he beats his breast, the sign of mourning, because he knows that's the wickedest thing to him is his heart. And he beats it. And he says, God, be merciful to me, not a sinner, the sinner, which translates not me in relation to the Pharisee, because there's a lot of us that would have said, I thank thee, O God, that I am not like this Pharisee. Yeah, I'm wretched, I'm nasty, I'm immoral, but at least I'm honest about it. Yeah, judge, I robbed the bank, sure, but, you know, I didn't wear a mask. <laughs> because there's a lot of guys that feel they are going to heaven because they are openly wicked. That cuts no ice. How many of you ever heard that deal? I don't go to church because of the hypocrite. Yeah, you hear it a lot. Well, this guy won't even lift his eyes to heaven. And he beats his breast and he says, God, I'm the only sinner in the world. And you know something interesting? The word there, mercy, it's a word that's only used about five, six times in our New Testament. I was kind of kidding around about the word propitiation. That's what the word is. God be propitiated to me, the sinner. The word mercy is a different word. It has the idea of someone's bowels being touched with compassion. The word mercy here is the word hilasmos. In the Old Testament, the Helasterion was the mercy seat in the Ark of the Covenant. You saw the movie. You got a big, you got this wooden chest in the temple of God. Actually, that was one of the things in Indiana Jones that was probably the only realistic thing there. It was a pretty good picture of the Ark of the Covenant. You had this wooden chest of acacia wood. You had these golden angels with their wings like this over it because it was a representation, a pattern of heaven of God in his splendor with the angelic presence about him. And in this chest was the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments, the holiness of God. And in between the angelic presence, the wings, there is the Shekinah. And it looks down on the violated law. It's God's presence looking down on God's heart. And there's the sin of Israel laid before him. And that priest in a great act of children's mind to teach the nation would take a goat, lay his hands on the goat, pronounce the sin of Israel on that animal, tie it to the horns of the altar, cut its throat, take its blood, and the nation saw a vivid picture. He dies instead of us. A perfect animal instead of us. Go in before the very presence of God. Do you know that in the Holy of Holies of God in the Old Testament, 
they tied a rope to the high priest's ankle in case he fell dead in God's presence. His presence was so holy, it was tough to get a detachment to go get him. And so you would tie an, a rope to his ankle to drag him out if he fell dead. And he would go into God's presence, and he would take the blood of that animal. And seven times. Now normally when you took the blood of the animal, in all other sacrifices, you would take a sprig of hyssop, a weed with bristles, and you would touch it. Because there was no human element touching it. But this time the priest would take his finger. Because he was the representative of the nation. And he would sprinkle it. Because the nation was sinful. And it fell down upon the helasteron, the mercy seat. And now God saw from his presence the violated law of God. But he saw it through the shed blood. And on the place of mercy, on that one spot, that's where God met with Israel. Where blood was shed. And that term, mercy seat, is translated in our New Testament, propitiation. You know what propitiation means? It's the word here. It's a synonym for the word satisfy. And it means that the wrath of God was satisfied in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Think of it like this. In the cross, it has three directions. Redemption, reconciliation, and propitiation. Those are the three aspects of the cross. Sinward, manward, Godward. Sin, the wage of sin is death. The payment to sin has to be death. Christ died. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. One died for all. Therefore all died. He redeemed. He paid for our sin by the currency of his shed blood that is all God would accept. So the cross had a sinward aspect. The cross had a manward aspect. That when a person trusts in Christ, he goes from being a sinner to a son. From in Adam to the last Adam being part of one in whom is condemnation and death to being part of one in whom is life and eternality. He is changed back. Kata back lasso, changed. Katalaso means to reconcile, to conciliate back, reconciliate. And it means that you are loved back to where you had never sinned. They said to Clara Barton once about a person that had offended her, they said, are you aware that he had done this? And this originator of the Red Cross, this great godly lady, said, I distinctly remember forgetting that. Now that's what it means to be reconciliated. I don't just love you, now get away from me, I forgive you. It's I love you and it's like you never did it. To be reconciliated is to be kataliso, to be lasso changed kata back to the way that you were and in purity, as if you had never done it. And so the cross is sinward. We're redeemed. It is manward. We are changed back to complete acceptability. And the cross is Godward, that he is propitiated. Man is changed. Sin is redeemed. But God's holy wrath was expended on that person. The Old Testament Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, or like we call it in Dallas, Yom Kippur. All right. If you ever meet a Jewish guy, don't talk about Yom Kippur. That's like talking about San Antonio, the Alamo or something, you know. It's rude. Yom, the day fire of covering on Yom Kippur. That was the day in October that Sandy Koufax would never pitch because he was Jewish. World Series. But on the Day of Atonement, that high priest, like I said, would lay hands on that animal. And that one man at that one place, on that one site, on that one day, in that one way, would meet with God for atonement. And God taught Israel for 1,500 years. I don't blink at your sin. Someone must die. A certain someone at a certain time, at a certain place, in a certain way. And there my wrath will be expended. Christ's death 
does not atone for sin. It does not cover merely. Christ's death, what did John the Baptist say? Behold the Lamb of God who bears away the sin of the world. The Old Testament covered sin. In Christ's death, he buried it, took it away, left it there. What did the cross do? It was sinward, it was manward, it was godward. And that's the idea in the heart of this tax collector that the Holy Spirit of God takes and captures in the Bible. And that's the term our Savior applied to him. That what that tax collector said was, God, I can't look upon you. I'm standing at a distance. I can't go near to you. I beat my breast because that's my problem. God, be propitiated to me on the basis of the sin offering, on the basis of the lamb that died. Strike him, not me. And because of that, show mercy toward me, the sinner. If no one else in this world has ever sinned, God, I've sinned. I can't look at you. I can't come near you. All I can do is offer up a prayer. Jesus said, that fellow, in verse 14, went down to his house as if he had never, ever sinned. That's what the word justified means. It means that he is declared by an official judge with all knowledge, all wisdom, and with all punitive power, that judge declared him as not guilty on the basis of the shed blood of a substitute. That man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Why? Because the other guy never mentioned mercy, grace, forgiveness, or sin. All he did, verse 9, he told this parable to certain ones who did what? Trusted in themselves that they were righteous. This guy appraised his life, I, I, I. This guy drew his standard, tax collector, adulterer, swindler, unjust. This guy made his pronouncement. I thank thee, O God, I am not like. Are you going to heaven? Yes. The biblical question is, says who? Says who? Pharisee, are you going to heaven? Yes. Says who? Says me. How do you know? I'm better than him. Says who? Says me. How do you know? My judgment of my life. Pharisee, what's God think? Oh, I don't know. I think I told you before, when I was in Atlanta Federal Penitentiary speaking, I discovered something that nobody there is guilty. <laughs> They're all innocent. I talked to them. They had investigated their lives, they had made their pronouncement, and they were innocent. But when the gates opened, I was the only guy that walked out. Do you know why? Because we could have all stood at the gate and said, we'd like to leave and enter into freedom. We're all innocent. The judge or the guy at the gate would have said, says who? Does the court say you're innocent? No, no not really. <laughs> I got thrown in the life. Well, I don't care what you think, and I don't care how you judge yourself, and I don't care what your standard is and your pronouncement and your omniscience of who you are. What does the judge say? The judge said, I was innocent, humanly speaking, and I got to leave. You going to heaven? Sure am. Who cares? What's God say? God so loved the world that he gave his only son as our propitiation, redemption, and reconciling. That whoever just trusts and what he did shouldn't perish but have without anything. It's a possession as if it's already happened. Life eternal. They skate because of the grace of God. That's what God said. Great text, isn't it? You know why this text is here? 
This text is one breath of the parable you heard last week. See verse 8? Look at verse 8. 18 verse 8. I tell you, God will bring about justice for his elect speedily. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith, be faith on the earth. And then he goes to this parable. Do you know what this parable is called by Jesus Christ? The faith. This is what we believe. You can have a difference on a whole lot of peripheral issues. But my friend, you missed this one. And you are now definitively cultic. What is a Christian? A Christian is one who by the grace of God cannot lift his eyes to heaven in his sin. He cannot pronounce one thing good about himself. He cannot approach God in himself. He cannot compare himself to the worst of men, for he is the sinner. He appeals to the mercy of God because of the shed blood of one who died in his place. And he is pronounced at that point righteous. That is the faith. And you've got to hit it straight right there. You know what's interesting about the Apostle Paul? And I want to apply this to you. I had a seminary prof that changed my life as much as any guy I've ever been around. Dr. John Hannon taught church history there, historical theology. And he said, fellas, let me tell you something interesting about the great men and great women of Christianity. He said, the older that you get in the faith, if you are truly growing, the more Calvinistic you should become. Now let me explain what that means. The older that you get in the faith, the more like males get set the fact that you and I were totally depraved. And by totally, I mean my mind could not come to the knowledge of God. My soul could not sense God. My body was cursed and dying. My emotion was not sensitive to it. You hear these guys share their testimony. I found the Lord. To which you want to say, I didn't know he was lost. It was not God that was lost. It was us. We were totally depraved. And left to myself, I freely would choose sin. It may be a self-righteous act, or it may be perversion, but I would sin. I would renounce God and his atonement. I might be religious, but I would not be Christian. I might try to meritoriously work my way to God, but the cross would be offensive on my best day. Unless a monogistic act of God, not a synergistic God of God working with me, what part did I have in my salvation? Whenever you go to a funeral sometime and walk by the casket, see just as I am to that body. See if it comes forward. Tell it if there's a bus, it'll wait. And we're just sitting there all day. You had as much chance responding to God in your deadness as a corpse does to the call of God. You were dead. When we were dead in our transgressions and sin, in which we formerly walked according to the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit that is even now working in the sons of disobedience, but God, rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenlies. For by grace are ye saved by faith. Not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of your works, lest anyone should boast. I thank thee that I am not like this guy. And that's what I mean, and I agree with it fully. The more mature a Christian is, the more crystallized it gets in our thinking that we were sinners. What does John Newton sing in his song, Just As I Am, or rather, uh, Amazing Grace? Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. 
His grace has brought me safe thus far. And grace will lead me home. It is the grace of God that we are saved. And that is why the older that a Christian gets, the more lowly in mind he perceives his righteousness. And the lower he perceives his ability to have saved himself, the greater God becomes. And the more exalted his worship becomes, and the more fascinated that woman is, that man, with the person of Christ. And when they have fully understood the grace of God, then they are like Mary Magdalene. And they are weeping on his feet, letting down their glory to wipe it. They are like Mary of Lazarus, and they're breaking their alabaster jar and taking their best and pouring it on him because his death is a precious thing. They are like Mary Magdalene at the tomb, hanging on to him. I'll never let you go. That's when grace is not so. You know, it's interesting. The Apostle Paul, writing in about 51 AD, the Corinthians, he said of himself, that I am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. As a matter of fact, you know what Paul called himself? Listen to this. Christ has appeared to Peter, to James, to 500 brethren, most of them alive until now. And then he appeared as to a miscarriage, as to me. Those other disciples were nurtured through three years. Paul got converted like a miscarriage. Boom! He was there. He was off the donkey on the ground. And he was converted. How fast does it take to fall from the donkey to the ground? That's the conversion of the Apostle Paul. He said, I was a miscarriage. I came forth speedily. It was God's grace. Now that's what Paul thought of himself in 51. In about 64 AD, you know what Paul said of himself then? He was writing first, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's in his, um, his first imprisonment. And he's writing to the Ephesians. You know what he said of himself then? He said, I am not worthy, or he said, I'm the least of all saints. That was it. I am the least of all saints. So he went from being not worthy to be an apostle, but I'm the lowest Christian because I persecuted the church of God. And then in his third to last letter in 1 Timothy, you know what he writes there just a couple of years before his death? It's a trustworthy statement. Deserving full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am chief. Number one. I am number one. I am number one. That was the Apostle Paul. I'm the chief of sinners because I persecuted the church of God. Paul never forgot to the end of his life that while we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. And that's the way we should be. The older you get as a Christian, the lower you should perceive your ability to have saved yourself. The higher the grace of God, the farther he had to reach, the deepest he had to bring you from, the height he had to bring you to. Isn't that great? Grace gone putrid. Watch this. Don't worry about it right there. Go to Isaiah, and I'm going to show you just quickly an Old Testament coordinate. Now you say, well, that Pharisee was a pretty wretched guy. The Apostle Paul was a pretty wretched guy when he was Saul of Tarsus. How about Isaiah, chapter 6? Isaiah was a pretty fair guy. He wrote a book that spanned 50 years, about six kings, 66 different chapters. He saw the glory of God. He would be an interesting guest speaker. This guy's got some credentials. Watch this. Threadbare text, but just stay with me. Isaiah 6 and verse 1. I'm overwhelmed with this text. In the year of King Uzziah's death, King Uzziah ruled for 52 years. 
To the best of my knowledge, there was only one other king that ruled longer than him. What's 52 from 93? 19 what? 41? Right? That's his head, man. I'm looking at the wrong guy, Doug. All right. 1941, World War I was going on. And this guy was king. You know, the longest reign we had was FDR. That was about, you know, three terms plus. This guy is 52 years. The king is dead. It's a barren time for Israel. I saw the Lord sitting on the throne. Here's the king of kings. Here's the Lord of lords. Here's the one that is deathless, to whom belongs immortality. I saw the Lord on the throne, lofty and exalted, the train of his robe filling the temple. In those days, the way that a person by protocol would show their greatness was by their robes train. And kings would have trains that were of great length. This king's train in the heavenly court goes from his throne up the back wall and fills the entire temple. And that's all that this man can see of his train. Do you all remember whenever Moses said to God, I want to look at you, show me your glory, and God said, you can't look at my face, no one can look at me and live, and I'll put you in a rock beside me in a cleft of it, and I'll cover you with my hand. And what did Moses see? God passed by, and he saw his train, his hindmost part. That is all that man can see, is God's going by and what God has declared himself as being and doing. We can only look at the train of his robe. Moses said, what's your name? God said, Aye, sir, Aye. I will be that I will be, i.e., you can't know me. I'm beyond you. I'm holy. I'm the holy other. I'm apartheid. I'm infinite. You're finite. I'm great. You're lowly. You can't know me. And you can't mutter and think through who I am. I will be whom I declare myself as being and reveal myself as being. And only then can you know me. And Gautama can sit under the Bodai tree until the cows come home. Joe Smith can sit in the forest until the Mets win. And he ain't going to know Aye, sir, Aye. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Now we see who God is. God is unknowable, and the only way you can know it is not by looking upon him, but by seeing what he has declared himself as being. And so he sees the train of his robe, this great king. Verse 2, burning ones, seraphim. That's what a seraph is. It's a burning one. Our God is a consuming fire. And these burning ones from his presence stood above him, each having six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. With two, he split. That's the way you did in the presence of royalty. Do you know that? When you went in the presence of royalty, you bowed. And you covered your face, you couldn't look on them. And you would cover your feet, the ugliest thing about you. Your dirt and your face, you would cover it. You would kneel, and you would put your face to the ground. And these angels in God's presence can't look upon him. Not his essential glory. They're finite beings. And with six wings, they cover their face. They cover their feet. We have a, historically it is said, that the salute came from soldiers in the presence of the queen when she would survey her troops. And they would shield their face from her glory. That's the salute. Historically, when little girls would be in the presence of nobility, what would a little girl do to cover her feet? She would curtsy. And she would place her dress down on her feet. These are angels curtsying and saluting in God's presence. They can't look upon it. Verse 3, one called out to the other and said, and this is what's called antiphonal singing. One angel cried out, holy. 
and the other cried out, Holy. And the other cried out, Holy. And the other cried out, Holy. This is the only song they sing in heaven. It's a one verse, one word song. Holy. It's the only attribute of God that's mentioned three times. Thrice holy God. The word kadash in Hebrew means to separate. And what these angels are saying is he is apartheid. That's the way we would call it. He is completely segregated. He can have no part of anything finite. He's holy. He is the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts is the title called Lord Sabbath. And it means he's the commander of the angelic presence. He's the one before whom the angels bend their knees. The whole earth is full of his glory. Probably that's speaking in what is called in Hebrew the prophetic perfect, where you look at a future act like it's already happened. The Old Testament says on three occasions, As I live, says the Lord, the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. And these angels look at the king in his reign and his majesty, that it's already happened. The earth is full of his glory because the earth is his footstool and heaven his throne. Verse 4, the foundations of the thresholds trembled. What's a threshold? That's the little place where you come into the presence of somebody else. It's a, an aperture that you cross. The threshold of the temple trembled where Isaiah is. He hears something. He smells the smoke. He feels the trembling. His senses are alive with the holiness of God. Incidentally, you know what the word profane means? Pro, finero. Finero means to appear. Pro means to appear before. The word profane has the idea of someone walking into the presence of a mighty person and crossing. As a matter of fact, the word profane in the New Testament is the word bibios that means threshold. Profane means that you appear before somebody like they meant nothing. Whenever the president is in town, try to walk up to him. Hey, Bill, what's happening? See what happens. Some civil service guy or secret service guy stick a gun right in your nose. And he will say, don't you try to appear before the president of the United States. They talked in England about when that guy snuck into Buckingham Palace, into the Queen's bedroom, sat on her bedstead, and chatted with her. England was aghast that a commoner had profaned the Queen. No, the threshold trembles. You don't profane God. Hey, what's happening, God? It shakes. Verse 4, or verse 5, here's what he does. In seeing, smelling, hearing, feeling the holiness of God. What would an American do? He'd have grabbed his camera. Man, I got to get this. <laughs> this is in, could you move the angel as you? That's what an American would do. He really would. Americans are profane. We're Democrats. The people are all. Yeah. Nobody else can. Here's what Isaiah says. He says, Woe is me. I am undone. To be undone means that all of your sockets, all of your muscles go completely limp and you have no life. You're a dead man. Whenever Christ appeared in his glory before John, what did he do? fell as a dead man. Isaiah falls as a dead man. Ezekiel fell as a dead man. Daniel fell as a dead man. They're undone. It's always interesting when you ask these guys that don't know Christ, what will you do when you stand before the Holy God? What will you say? Well, I'll say, yeah, 
Oh, let me give their resume. In the presence of the Holy God, there will be no appearing before him. There will be no profaning of it. The thresholds will tremble. Men that are not covered in the blood of Christ and women that will simply become morally disintegrated. They will fall. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth stand silent before him. Nobody says anything. He says, where is me? I am disintegrated. I have nothing to say. I have nothing to do. I'm condemned. Because I am a man of unclean lips. See, your mouth always dredges out of your heart. How many of you, if I said this evening, we've got a surprise for you. Today, at random, without your knowing, we take 45 seconds of the random conversation of one of you. And we just like to play it here this evening. I haven't listened to it myself. If I went to punch that, and we listened to 45 seconds of your conversation, how many of you would be beseeching God that it might be someone else, not you? Because the man speaks out of that which fills his heart. And our mouth is guilty of profanation, of coarse jesting, of cursing, of slander, of gossip. You name it, our mouth can articulate it. You know, a mouth is an amazing thing. It's the only muscle in your body that's unattached. And you can take a diaphragm and compress it. You can force air up through this voice box. You can take these little chords and you can vibrate them uh, and you can get a column of sound. You can send it out on airwaves and these things right here can pick it up. They can run it through here and you can take a column of sound and you can shape it through hard and soft palate and vowels and consonants and you can take cup and butt and butt and butt and all that stuff and you can round it together with A-I-E. All right. And you can take that column of sound like ceramics and you can shape it into where you can take your heart, put it out in the air, and you can put it in somebody else's heart. And you can say to somebody, I have paid your debt. <laughs> or you can say, I love you, and I can make them feel any way I want. Your mouth is a barometer of your soul. By a man's words shall he be condemned, and by his words shall he be justified. Our mouth tells what we are. And so when Isaiah says, I'm undone because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I'm among a people of unclean lips. Listen, this is a wicked nation, but next to God, we're all the same. And here's why. My eyes have seen the king. Folks, that's the way that we are before God. What's the solution? Verse 6. And seraphim flew to me, not me to him. He takes a burning coal in his hand from the altar of tongues because even an angel can't touch it. There is no human or finite element upon this place of sacrifice. You take a coal of sacrifice where the lamb dies and the angel can't touch it. Isaiah can't touch it. Only tongues can touch it. It's of no human finite element. It's God's sacrifice. And he goes to Isaiah. And there's unclean lips. In verse 7, he touches his lips. And God pronounces him clean because of the blood of the sacrifice. The burning place where a man said, I thirst on that place where he died. The coal, the ember, the residue of his death can touch your lips. And we don't have to scour it. One touch, and you're clean. And he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away. Your sin is forgiven. Would you look real close at what Isaiah did? He did nothing. It's an act of the grace of God. This is one of the greatest pictures of Calvary in our Bible. And that man now in verse 8, God said, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? The Trinity, here am I, send me. 
Such is the sufficiency of Christ's death that one touch and we are clean. Folks, do we need to beat this horse anymore? Do we all as Christians see why we are called Christian? Because our salvation is not because of us. We are not called legalians. We are not Mosaians that trust in Moses. We're not a Tomian that trust in me or a Dudgeon. All right. Doug's not a Dudgeon that trusts in himself. He is a Christian that trusts in Christ. And I'm a Christian, and Paul was a Christian. And Peter said, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not feel ashamed. And in Antioch, where Paul taught, where they first called Christians, because this guy taught the grace of Christ. That's what a Christian is. And if you have never trusted Christ, we can't do any better than this. The Lamb has been slain. Sin, man, God have been dealt with. It's there. It's just waiting for you, by God's grace, as he touches your heart, to say, woe is me. I'm unclean. They're unclean. And you just lay there. And you open your heart by faith to trust in what Jesus Christ has done. And you let him touch your lips. One touch. And you are fit for heaven. That's its sufficiency. And for you that know the Savior, the more mature you get, the more humble you should become. There is no place for pride and grace. They said to Spurgeon, What shall we call you? Reverend? He said, Call me Mr. Spurgeon. He said, I cannot put in the same sentence, Reverend and sinner. We are sinners. Y'all know who H.G. Wells was? Wrote War of the World? famous agnostic great knock of the faith. He didn't like Christians. He didn't like ministers. He particularly did not like Anglicans. And he wrote a story once for a particular American magazine. And in the study, it was about an Anglican priest. And everybody that would come to him, he would give them the same counsel. He would say, have you prayed about it? He got to where he could say it with great depth and profundity. Have you prayed about it? That was all the counsel he gave. Now, he never prayed himself, but that was his counsel. Have you prayed about it? Well, one day, the story goes, his life caved in for various and sundry reasons. And he had nowhere to turn. You know what he did? He decided he'd take his own counsel. He decided he'd pray about it. So he did. Only problem was he'd never prayed. So what he did in the story is he put on his flock... He got as pious as he could get. He went into his chapel late at night where no one would see him. He got all the candles ready. He walked up the aisle. The carpet crunched under his feet. He knelt at the prayer rail. Velvet crushed under his knees. He positioned himself, cleared his throat, <coughs> looked around in the ceiling, the place he felt would be an appropriate place to speak to God at. Focused on the place in the corner. He lifted up his voice and he said as piously as he could, God? Well, he said that at that moment there was a very stern, authoritative voice from the ceiling. Yes! What is it? The scene changes. The next morning, his parishioners came in, and they found their priest face down on the floor, dead. And they took him, and they rolled him over, and Wells, in his manner, said his eyes were wide in terror. Story. The point of Wells was quite well taken as a non-Christian perceiving Christian. His point was these Christians that speak of God and speak to God 
they would be terrified if they ever met him. Be merciful to me, O God, the sinner. Well, let's pray.